Oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let me grab some, some, some notes. I feel like I don't necessarily need these, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, grab on them. Romans chapter 5, verse 17. Romans chapter 5, verse 17. Um, I am, uh, oh man, Easter. Man, I love Jesus. Man, I love Jesus. I'm sorry. Romans chapter 5. This uh, is an interesting and powerful chapter. And, and Romans chapter 5 uh, begins to teach us about verse 17. About how that one man's offense brought death into the world. Speaking of Adam. And he said that by one man's righteousness, grace and the gift of righteousness will reign by one. It says that by one man, sin entered, and by one man, freedom from sin entered. And that's why we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. I, I was listening to something, and this guy was sharing about, uh, somebody was being very, I don't know what was going on, but he was talking about, Stuff and the, the guy was, was very angry that they were there for whatever reason. And he asked him if he believed in Jesus, and the guy said no. And I, I often wonder myself how anybody doesn't believe in Jesus. You know what year it is. Do you know how you know what year it is? Because of Jesus. I don't know how anybody could say a thing like, I don't believe in Jesus. I mean, they could say, well, I haven't accepted him. I don't believe he's God. They could say all of that stuff. But how do you say you don't believe in Jesus? Whoo! Talk about your deniers. We know there was a Jesus. And we know what he did, came to do. There in that Romans chapter 5, it begins to tell us that Jesus, what Jesus' purpose was to bring freedom. In, in chapter 6, uh, Paul begins to teach... What do we do now? We've got the grace of the Lord and, and, and God has brought grace to us. Do we just keep sinning and let grace abound? Do, do we just keep living like we always lived? Now that we have Jesus, does, does nothing change except that now we have Jesus? And he, and, and he begins to say, no, 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 no. Come on, people. Come on. I'm not telling you that you, everything is supposed to stay the same because of the resurrection of Christ. He said, oh, no, no, no. In verse 4, it said, We're buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. For we are planted together in the likeness of his death, so also we should be planted in the likeness of his resurrection. I love this. Knowing this, that the old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve Sin. We are literally to be changed, to be transformed, to become something new. Christ did not die and come and do all of that so you could be stuck in the exact same place you were before you came to Christ. He didn't do it so you could be right where you were before. He did it so that you could be freed. And that you could live a new life, just like Christ lived a life. A new life. Ooh. Luke, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and 17, the scripture says, If any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. Behold, all things have passed away and all things have become new. When we have recognized who Christ is, when we come to Christ, when we, when we make this thing, we understand him, we believe in him, we, we make this uh, uh, thing, when we believe in Christ and we follow him and we surrender to him, we become a new creature. The old has passed away. At least it should. Smile at me. I want to get very real with you this morning. Okay, I want to get very real with you. Turn me to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Oh. Luke chapter 13. Christ did not pay the price 
so I could be stuck and stay where I was in the past. Luke chapter 13. And there were at that season some that told him, they were telling Jesus, of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. They began to tell him, can you believe of this evil that's being done? And Jesus said, do you suppose that these Galileans were sinners above all Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall also likewise perish. And then he keeps on. Or those 18 upon whom the tower of Siloam fell and slew them, do you think that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Uh, was that a repeat? Yeah. He literally said the exact same thing. And I want to share with you that God did not pay the sacrifice of Christ so you could remain stuck in the same place that you've always been. Hallelujah. And that this, this place of being changed, of being transformed, of, uh, uh, of seeing God move in our life, continues throughout our entire life. I'm going to tell you, I'm learning this. I'm learning the power of God's transforming. My heart aches because I, I, I know God can change you, transform you, move you into the promises of God, change everything about what's going on in your life. And I know he can. I know he can because he did it for me. At 13, I started sneaking out of the house to get high. I didn't know, I couldn't go to sleep. It was like I, I couldn't go to sleep without being high. Everybody would go to bed and I'd, I'd slip out, try to sneak out somewhere to get some kind of a drug. I remember my father came to me one night. He was a concrete finisher, so I know something about that now, now that I've almost 40 years in the trade. They work you really hard. As a concrete finisher. And my dad came to me one night. He said, Dale, listen, son, I'm so tired. Please stay home tonight. Please. I can't be up worrying about you. I'm exhausted. Please stay home tonight. No problem, dad. Everybody went to bed. And I slipped out and took off. The man that I was, the person that I was, needed a savior on a desperate level. My heart is crushed. You know how many times I went to wake him up? Hey, Dad, I rolled my car. Would you come get me? And he would climb out of bed and come and help me push my car. and bring. Me. You were rotten. Yes, <laughs> I was. I needed a savior. I needed a God who was real, a God who wanted to change me, a God who didn't want to leave me where I was, but wanted to make something new out of me, who wanted to transform my life. I needed a God who was bigger than just some feeling or emotion, but a God who would make a difference for me. I needed a God that would change me. And that is the God that I met. And that's the God that began to work in my life. I'll never forget after, after I begin to pour my life, after I begin to, 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 to pour my heart out to him, after I begin to recognize that he wanted all of me. Long stories. I, I, I'm going I'm to get into some of it, but I can't get into all of it. I, it's it's going to take too long. I'd have about five sermons, but you guys are really smart, so we're going to condense this into one. One of the greatest moments in my life was when a girl I was dating said to me, you sure wouldn't fit in in the public school. Why? Because I love Jesus and I wouldn't do what the world did and I wouldn't listen to their music and I wouldn't, all the things that the world would do, I wouldn't do. And she said to me, you wouldn't fit in in the public school. That was one of the greatest compliments I have ever got in my entire life. And none of it was me. It was God that had transformed me and changed me. 
That's the God that I want to share with you this morning. He's a God that wants to change you, transform you, and, and, and radically, radically, radically change your life. Yeah. Amen. Now, by the way, that was a long time ago when I used to get high, just so you know. That was a long time ago. I want to share with you four places of change in our life. I want to share these with you. See, I don't know where you're at today. I don't know which one, but I don't know where you're at in your life with Christ. But I want to share with you four places of change with Christ. All right? Um, and we're going to start in 2 Corinthians 7.11. I love this because it's easy to remember because 7.11, you know, the store. You didn't know that? 7.11. Easy to remember. 2 Corinthians 7.11. Eleven. Now stick a finger there, put a marker there, put your, I, I don't know, we're going to come back to this quite a bit, so uh, put, put something there, 2 Corinthians 7, 11, and, and put, put a marker there. Actually, I already, I did put a marker there on mine. There you go. Put your Bible marker, do something, because we're going to come back to this several times. All right, I got to go. Father, put your anointing on your word. Please, oh God, teach us, instruct us, give us wisdom and understanding, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Paul, writing to the Corinthian church, begins to write here in 2 Corinthians, if you back up, he begins to write how that he knew that he had made them sorrowful. He knew that he had brought a hard message to them with the first epistle. And he knew that. And in, in verse 9, he, he says, I rejoice not that you were made sorrow, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorrow after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation. Not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world works death. For you hold this selfsame thing, that you sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it brought in you. What clearing of yourself, yea, what indignation. Please keep your fingers in there, your, put a marker in there, do something. He said, I brought unto you, you were made sorry. He said, I pointed out the stuff in your life. You see, I knew that I was bringing pain to my father. I knew I was, I was living a life that was no good for anybody. I was a user, I was an abuser, I tried to, I, I used people. I was not a good person. But I thought it was okay because I thought I was, you know, hey, I like it, must be okay. But I came to a realization. I love this scripture. And it, it says that you, what carefulness it brought in you. You saw the pain, you saw the anguish, you saw the fact that you were not living like you should. And it brought sorrow and pain and hurt to you. And it said you begin to be very careful, you begin to pay attention to that. And then it says, what clearing of yourselves, that word in the original means, if you will, apologize. It means to apologize, to rest, recognize that you are a, a sinner, that you have made a mistake, and to apologize. And I love this next word, indignation. And this word indignation is a disgust and an anger. For the old man and the old ways. Indignation. He said, when the word came to you, you recognized that you are a sinner. I'm not looking at you. You realize you're a sinner. And in that sin, anguish began to come because you realized the pit that you were in, the pain there. Listen to me. There's a place of change that we get to when we finally get to the pit of our lives. Many of us have known that change. <laughs> I love the story of the prodigal son. And I'm not going to turn all of these because we don't have a lot of time. But in Luke chapter 15, the story of the prodigal son. You know the story, right? Or maybe you don't. Let me explain. Two guys had a, two, this man had two sons. One of his sons says, please give me my inheritance now so I can party. And the father gave him his inheritance. And he went out and he partied it up, lived it up. He had all the money. His, he, he had it. He lived it up. And he spent all of the inheritance partying and having fun. And then all of his friends abandoned him. 
when he got broke. And he found himself in a pig pen. Now, if you were a Jew, they wouldn't even touch a pig. So this is like the lowest of the lowest, the pit of the pit, the bottom of the bottom, the utmost of the bottom in this story. Is that he ended up feeding the pigs. And he realized where he was. And he said, I need out of here. One of the first places we change in our life is when we realize the pain of our situation that something needs to change. We recognize with true sorrowful hearts for the mistakes we've made and we apologize to God and the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. That's number one. Number two, back to there where we were in 2 Corinthians. What clearing of yourself and what indignation, what fear and what vehement desire, what fear and desire. The next second place that we change in life is when, I love this word, the fear. Do you know what the fear is? The fear is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of understanding God. It's like the, it's like the starting place of understanding God. I love this story. Remember Jonah? God speaks to Jonah. Jonah. What? Jonah, go to Nineveh. Jonah goes, no, I don't think so. Jumps the ship, splits. I'm not going to Nineveh. In the story, right? You know the story. Big fish swallows Jonah. Spits him out on the bank. <laughs> no thank you for that one. Spits him out on the bank. He gets out on the bank. He begins to cry out. God says, go tell Nineveh I'm going to destroy them. And he goes to Nineveh and he begins to share. He says, for 40 days he travels through and he tells Nineveh, God is going, God is going to destroy you because of your wickedness. God is going to destroy you because of the wickedness. Something happened in Nineveh. The king heard the message and it says he believed the word. He believed it. And he began to fear God. He began to believe that word. He began to fear God. And he said, that's it. Everybody in this kingdom is now fasting and seeking and going to follow God. And it created in them a huge desire, at least in him, a huge desire to please God. And the truth is that sometimes in our life we change when we simply learn enough about who God is, when we learn enough about what God has, when we learn enough about him that we want to change. Can I tell you something? If you don't want to change, how many of you are going to? I don't want to change. My life is good. Things are fine. I don't want to change. Second place that people change is when they actually get enough understanding of God that they recognize they cannot stay where they are and they want more. <laughs> they want more. And they begin to change. All right, number three. I love this. I love this. So... What indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, and what revenge. What zeal and what revenge. They became completely inspired to act. The truth is that many of us, listen, and these are very progressive. If you can't recognize your sin, and come to God and repent and turn from that and accept it, you can't move on. Okay? You get stuck right there. You can't move on. But you come to God, you realize you need a God that just said you move on from there. And then you begin to learn about God and then and then a desire begins to swell up within you to do more, to grow, to be, to, to find more of Him. And then something happens and inspiration begins to take place. You see God moving enough. Something begins to happen in your life and inspiration takes place. And when inspiration takes place and zeal takes place, you, your life begins to come alive with change. I'm ready to change. Listen, I want to change because of inspiration, not because of desperation. Come on. <laughs> I'd rather change because of inspiration rather than desperation. But if you don't change with inspiration, pretty quick you're going to have to change because of desperation. You can write that one down. 
Change because I'm inspired is better than changing because I'm desperate. Just words up, heads up. All right. Oh, man, I love this. I love this. Moses is out there watching the sheep. He's just out there living. All of a sudden, there's a bush burning out in the middle of nowhere. Huh. I'm excited. I think it actually broke. Oh, maybe not. Okay, there you go. All those online, sorry, I don't know when it fell. Let me say it again. It, serving inspiration to moving you to action is better than desperation moving you to action. Just in case I missed that out there. All right. So Moses, he gets out there, and he's in the field, and he sees the burning bush. I love what the Lord said to him. You know, take off your shoes, right? You're on holy ground. But then he said something else. He said, I want you to go get my people and bring them into a land flowing with milk and honey. He said to Moses, listen to me, man. We are going to go get those people out of bondage out of those things, and we're going to bring them into a land flowing with milk and honey. God began to try to inspire Moses. He did. And what was Moses' response? Uh, I think you have the wrong guy. This morning, I want you to be inspired by what God wants to do in your life. I want you to recognize that there is so much more. If I could somehow inspire you to begin to change, to begin to move forward, if I could inspire you to recognize what God can do in you, if I could get that through to you this morning, we would change the world. <laughs> Moses is like, must be talking to somebody else. Maybe you're sitting in this place and you think that pastor's not talking to me. Yes, I am. My suggestion is turn now before it gets desperate. Turn now before it gets desperate. So Moses is out there and he says to God, who, me? And God says, yeah, you. And he's like, I, I don't think so. Prove it. <laughs> Watch when you tell God to prove something. He said, Stick your hand in your coat. Sure, God. Stick his hand in his coat. Pull it out. And he pulls it out and it is leprosy. Uncurable, flesh-eating disease. You got leprosy, you're done. There's no cure. There's no place. There's nothing left. He's saying, God, prove that you picked me. He said, put your hand. Pull it out. Leprosy. Now God has your attention. Put it back. Pull it out. It's healed and well. Okay. Maybe I can do this. Maybe I can do this. Take your stick, throw it on the ground. It became a snake. Pick it back up. Here. Now you believe he was inspiring. God, want, God, listen to me. These are places we change. One is when we're in the pit, the hardest time of our life, when you're at the lowest of the low of the low. Then we finally, right, the foxhole crying out to God. That's a good... It, it, God hears you in those places, but that's good. But then there's a place where we begin to know enough about God. We begin to understand enough about God that the desire to follow him and find him great gets better and better and builds in you. And you desire to change to find him. And the third place is where you're inspired to recognize that God has a purpose for you. God has a plan in your life. God has a desire to change you and to make your life better and better than you can ever imagine. Sometimes we'll change there. And the fourth one, I love this. Paul said, Behold this selfsame thing that you sorrowed after godly sort, what carefulness it brought in you, what clearing of yourself, what indignation, what fear, what desire, what zeal, what revenge. In all things you have approved yourself to be clear in this matter. And the fourth place that we change is a little bit 
It's something that I personally am trying to go through in my life. Can I, can I say that to you? It's a place that I am discovering. I've been pastoring for almost 30 years, and I feel like I have just discovered this place within the last two years, year and a half. Pastor Dale, you've been pastoring all this time, and you're just discovering this? Yeah, I am. Sure as you live, I am. And this forced place is a place where God compounds what he does in you and grows you and builds you and raises you up and gives you the ability to change, play things that you would never have the ability to have changed before. You will never have had the ability to do before. You couldn't have done those things before. Until God grew you up and changed you, you couldn't even accept the truth. I love this when Paul said to them, I can't even give you the meat of the word. I would love to give you the meat of the word, but I can't because you're carnal. I can't give you the deep stuff yet. The fourth place that we change is when we finally begin to grow to God to a place that we can even see the truth. It, 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 this, this is so, I, I'd like to spend a whole service on this. I'm going to be honest with you. It's amazing how many of us don't see freedom in our lives because we will never look outside of ourselves for help. We don't even, under, we can't, we just literally, this is in every, everywhere. I, I see this in workplaces. I see this everywhere. It's hilarious. I'm sitting in a meeting at the, church, at, at the job the other day. I'm sitting with a man who ha has been there longer than anybody else with this company. He's basically the top dog in the company as far as what everybody sees him as. And he says to me one day, I went to their leadership training classes and all it is is manipulation. Just manipulating people to do what you want. He said, you ask them what they want to do or you ask them what they think just so you can manipulate them to get them to do what you want. And I thought, you missed it, man. You missed it all the way through because you're still only willing to look at what you know to grow with. And I don't ask anybody on my crew what they think to manipulate them to do what I'm doing. I ask them what they think because they're brilliant people. We have to learn to grow into, and then God can change us. I love this. David, he's out in a field. I'm a musician. Let me tell you something about music. Anybody that's played an instrument, I have all these guys that are trying to play an instrument. Do you know what I know about me playing music? It's hard work. David, he's out there playing the harp, and he's playing the harp, and he's playing the harp, and he gets better, and he gets better, and he gets better, and he gets better. And he gets better. Pretty quick, he's playing the harp pretty good. King Saul begins to get troubled by an evil spirit. They said, send somebody. Send somebody to come and play and calm the evil spirit. I don't know how they found David out in the field, but they, they get David, they bring David in, and David begins to play before Saul, and the Holy Spirit begins to fall in the room, and, 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 the, and the presence of the Lord begins to help the king. So here's David, a shepherd. God said, I'm going to make you a king, and before I make you a king, I'm going to have to grow you. I'm going to have to build you. I'm going to have to do some things in you to let you know that it's me who's doing it. And so let's start with you ministering to the king, the little shepherd boy from over here come here go minister to the king God begins to build David remember the bear and the lion come up at his thing and he takes a slingshot knocks them both out takes out a bear takes out a lion why because God was building him for the moment when he stood before Goliath Woo. let me tell you something had God not built David had God not prepared David, he would not have been able to make the change and make a decision to go out there and meet that giant. How do I know that? Because I know that's how it works. If you don't allow God to build you, you won't be able to change. It's compounded upon itself. Okay. 
we know the story he did. He got out there, and who is this uncircumcised Philistines? And everybody's like, wow, how did he get all that boldness? Well, it was easy. God began to put him in front of the king. Can you imagine your first debut playing for the king? Huh. Walking well, there with a harp. Who am I? You're a nobody. You're a nobody of a nobody of a nobody. And you go in there on your first day, play for the king. You're like, man, if I hit a wrong note, am I like gone? Right? I mean, this is like it. But God raised him up, taught him, made his capability better and grew him so he could do and, and make the decision. The fourth place is absolutely true in our life. We change when we grow enough when we receive enough, when we grow enough in ourselves that we are able to make the choices in our life and change. Now, I don't know where you're at. I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know if you've ever accepted Christ or if you've ever even realized that you were a sinner bound for hell. I don't know. You may have never even heard somebody say before that without Christ, you're going to hell, but I'll say it to you. Okay? You may have never heard that before, but I'm going to tell you. Without Christ, you're going to hell. You may not understand. Maybe you did. Maybe you've accepted that. But you're stuck where you're at. Let me tell you something. It's time for you to learn. It's time for you to learn and to hear and begin to get close. Because when you do, your heart will begin to change. Your heart will begin to change and you'll begin to say, God, I want more of you. The desire will begin to spook in you. And this morning, I want to inspire you to understand there's better life ahead. Please hear me. There's a better life ahead for you. Please hear me. There's a better life than you're experiencing now. Go and live it. And I want to share with you that change continues to go forever. And you're not going to be stuck. The more you learn, the more you grow, the more God is able to put upon you, the more God is able to teach you, the more God is able to, to, to change your heart. So many things I'd like to, I, I don't mean to keep harping on this. I guess that's just where I'm at. <laughs> so I'm going to leave it alone. I'm going to move on. Well, wherever you're at this morning, here's what I know. If you're stuck, if you're in bondage, if you're feeling like things are stuck in your life, Christ sacrificed to set you free. At every level, at every place, at every step, Christ sacrificed to set you free. Amen. Let's pray. Can somebody go tell the kids, they told me to give them some time. You're on it. Is the baptismal full? Baptismal's full. Oh, yeah. Let's pray. Father, I come before you because it's Easter and it's, it's today is the day. Today is the day that we make a decision. I'm going to change. Maybe, there, maybe you're in a pit. Maybe you're in a place of, of hurting, of pain. Maybe you're in a place that's the lowest place you've ever been. And maybe that's you. God, I just surrender to you. God, I'm, I'm ready to repent and, res and surrender to your heart. Maybe you've done that. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you've done that, but you just feel... Like your desire has begun to wane. The Lord, I, 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 I pray right now that God, you can change that and bring our desire back. And I pray that right now. Maybe you just don't think you are good enough for God to use. Be careful with that one. You might find leprosy. Maybe that's you, though. Maybe you're in that place where, God, are you sure it's me? Are you sure you want me? And wherever you're at, maybe you're growing, maybe you're learning, I don't know, wherever you're at this morning, Christ died so we do not stay where we are. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.